Commander Diavolo Conroy of the Irish Ranger team assigned to assist Sister Geronima in whatever manner she wished to be assisted, considered this particular assignment, i.e. to escort twin boys to a black site facility in the Netherlands, the second lowest point of his career. The absolute lowest point being the time a Brigadier General ordered the entire squad to dress as manga clowns and fly a pony to his daughter's birthday party. The pony's name was Buckles, and it was, to put it delicately, a nervous flyer. Commander Conroy still shuddered when he thought back on that day. But at least he had understood the objective of Operation Buckles, deliver a pony to a child. This assignment, Operation Foul Swoop as it had been dubbed, was an altogether more mysterious and unsavory affair. Two months ago, the Spanish nun had simply driven into the Kurog army camp, swiping her way through several locked gates with that infernal black plastic cart of hers, and basically made herself at home in her semi-truckload of high-tech tricks. That ink-black card was the first thing about Sister Geronima to give Conroy the creeps. When Conroy had flashed his ID at the nun and asked her to explain herself, she had simply tapped his badge with her card and the black color had somehow flowed across from her ID to his. While he was still gazing at his altered card in slack-jawed amazement, he received a terse call from the Minister of Defense himself, who summarily informed Conroy that his squad had been deputized by a top-secret intergovernmental organization and he was to follow Sister Geronima's orders to the letter until his ID returned to its original color. And what if I don't, Minister? Conroy had brazenly asked. If you don't, the Minister had spluttered, you will find yourself changing the blue latrine blocks in an Antarctic research facility. This was a most specific threat, and it helped Diavolo Conroy decide to follow orders. So now, he and his highly trained men were delivering a pair of Irish twins to an industrial park near Schiphol Airport so they could be transported to a black site. Children in a black site? Sometimes Commander Conroy couldn't help wondering if he was still one of the good guys, if indeed there even were good guys anymore these days. That would be all, Commander Conroy. Geronima told him as soon as the chopper skids touched down. And my people would take it from here. Sister Geronima's people emerged from two SUVs, not of any make Conroy could identify. Two four-man teams just to transport a couple of sleeping 11-year-old children. Overkill, surely, thought Conroy. And for a moment, he entertained the crazy notion of defying the minister and pulling the chopper out of there before the payload could be transferred to the vehicles. But he didn't, because he was a soldier after all, and soldiers obeyed orders from the chief. Still, it didn't sit well with Conroy as, after the passengers disembarked, he gave the command to lift off, and he decided to ask some hard questions when he landed back in the Kurog. The only positive in this entire operation was that Conroy noticed that his ID had shed its skin of black and was back to its original color. As if the black sheen, or the nun herself, had never been there. On a side note, Conroy was true to his word and asked several hard questions of the minister upon his return to Ireland, but the answers were wishy-washy at best, so Diavolo handed in his resignation and carried around the guilt for what he considered an abduction until, almost two years later, he got the unexpected opportunity to both set things right with the twins and explain the origins of his unusual first name. But that is another story, which is, incidentally, even more surprising than this one. The first rule of interrogation is to question captives separately with the hope that their stories might contradict each other. Sister Geronima had handled scores of prisoners, suspects, and detainees in the span of her long career and had literally written a handbook on the subject, which was entitled Total el mundo hable frenadvede, or Everyone in the World Talks Eventually, in which Geronima laid out her interrogation philosophy. The thing to remember, she wrote in the foreword, is that everyone is guilty of something. If pressed on the matter, Geronimo would say that the strangest subject she had ever questioned was Gary Greyfeather, an African parrot that knew the combination of a cockney ganglord safe. It had taken her a few hours and a bucket of nuts, but eventually Gary had spilled the numbers. The parrot was about to be demoted to second place on the strange subject list after the Fowl Twins. Gerona's plan was as follows. She would place the twins in adjacent rooms and pose questions to both until some disparity appeared, and then she would use the difference in their stories to drive a wedge between them. Geronima was aware that Miles was a smart one, but she felt confident that he would crumble quickly in an interview situation. Miles awoke and quickly realized that all was not right in the foul world. For one thing, he was in a chair, which was most unusual for him. 
not being in a chair per se, but waking from slumber in a chair, for Miles was not the type of boy to simply nod off. He had not once, since the age of two, fallen asleep in a chair, sofa, or recliner. To explain, Miles' brain was so active that he was obliged to perform a nightly re relaxation routine in order to disengage his synapses. This routine involved, involved first inserting his nighttime mouth guard, then completing self-hypnosis exercises while focusing on Beckett's unusually musical snores. Beckett's snores, technically speaking, were not snores at all, but a trio of whistles that he exhaled through both of his nostrils and his mouth. This triple exhale was unusual enough in and of itself, but the really extraordinary thing was that each orifice played a different note. Notes that combined to form a perfect C major chord, which never failed to remind Miles of Beethoven's mass. Miles could not hear the chord now and knew that he had been separated from his twin. He looked around to find himself in an underground room with stone columns and vaulted arches. There were no visual cues to suggest that he was underground, but Miles could tell instinctively, something perhaps even about the heaviness of the air or pressure he felt in his skull, that he was below sea level. Miles' skull was very sensitive, and the least change in atmospherics could precipitate a migraine. Sister Geronima was seated across a table from him. Bizarrely enough, the nun was absently polishing a throwing knife in a casma cloth. Sad, thought Miles. Such a pathetic attempt to intimidate me. Geronima expects me to reference the knife, he realized, thus giving her the upper hand. Buenas tardes, Miles Fowl said the nun without looking up from her knife. You must have so many questions. It was true that there were things Miles needed to know, but he had answers too, should anyone care to pose the corresponding questions. He could have asked, Where am I precisely? Or indeed, Who exactly do you represent? Or certainly, What do you want with us? Miles knew that should he pretend to pass himself off as a frightened, witless youth to learn these things, Geronimo would see right through him. After all, his intellect was well documented. So, instead of firing off a barrage of questions, Miles said, You sedated us with the helicopter's oxygen masks. That was a despicable trick, sister. Geronimo was not in the least bit abashed. The levels are delicate. Sometimes people fall asleep. And then you are afraid to smuggle them into your subterranean base without fuss? I would guess we're in Amsterdam. Or perhaps Rotterdam, but I imagine Amsterdam. I do love Amsterdam. The Nemo Science Museum is a marvel, though I do worry about the eye theater architecturally. I have written letters to the board. Geronima gave Miles her full attention. Very good. How did you know we were in Amsterdam? This would usually have been a simple question for the nanny chip embedded in Miles' spectacles to answer. The map of their trip was displayed for his eyes only on the inside of his lenses. Unfortunately, Nanny had lost network outside Sheopol Airport, so Miles had been forced to make an educated guess. Never mind that, said Miles. I'm sure you must have questions. Oh, see, si, said Geronima. I have questions, but perhaps some answers too. I can tell you where your buzzer is. Miles rubbed the scar on his wrist. No need. Beckett is in the next room. You can see your twin. Are scars twinged like a former spiritual radar? said Miles. Usually I can see him too. Do not worry, Chico, said Geronima. You will be together soon. It was necessary to separate you for a short time, considering your peculiar situation. And which peculiar situation is that? This was a genuine question for Miles. The Fowls had, over the years, been involved in a great many peculiar situations. Is a fairy situation, said Geronima, and she placed the black pasta card on the table. Miles did not touch the card and made no attempt to scan it with his augmented spectacles. Even basic credit cards had photon technology now. Geronima had presented her card with such a flourish that Miles felt sure it was packed with advanced sensors and would detect a scan. Then he would lose his precious spectacles and he would now have no contact with Nanny, as his watch and smartphone had still beside his bed in Villa Echo. Don't worry, Nino, said Geronima, sensing Miles' hesitation. It is nothing but a card. We are very old school down here. There's not even the internet. Miles engaged his organic scanners, those being his eyes. At first glance, the card seemed blank, but then Miles noted seven embossed letters. Acronym, he read. 
I presume acronym is an acronym. You see, correcto, Myers, said Geronima. Acronym stands for Association para el Control, la Regulación y la Observación de los No Humanos y la Magia. You're telling me that the acronym for acronym is acronym? Miles asked. That sounds a bit forced if you don't mind me saying. And it only works in Spanish, though the agency name itself is English. I suppose you could do the better acronym, Chico, said Geronima, which was unfortunate, for Miles Fowl had always been a whiz at wordplay. Most certainly I could do better, said the Bespecto twin. Let me see. Off the top of my head, what about IMP, Imaginary Monster Patrol? I have added a second letter to the acronym there by linking the word itself to the organization. Geronima smiled thinly. Most amusing, but also insulting, no? I take your point. Let's try another one. Elf, excellent leprechaun force. I could do a few in Spanish if you like. Geronima shrugged. English, Spanish, it, it does not matter. The name is no importante. It is our actions that count. We are an international intergovernmental organization charged with monitoring ferry activity. Los no humanos, said Miles, not bothering to suppress a smirk. So tell me, sister, if I ignore the ridiculous premise of your group's very existence, what does your acronym want with us? Nada, we do not want anything, said Geronimo wide-eyed. We are merely protecting you. Miles laughed. <laughs> from a gunshot? Why would fairy hunters care about a shot from a human gun? We had a close shave, that is all. We do not care about this gunshot, but you are most interested in a dissipating island. There you have me at a disadvantage, said Miles. I genuinely have no idea what you're talking about. Which was not the whole truth. The nun's eyes narrowed as she began twirling the throwing knife on the table. After the gunshot, Vina Echo simply disappeared momentarily and then came back into view. We do not have such technology, so it must be magic. Miles laughed. <laughs> really, sister? Magic is your first part to call. Why not aliens? Why not alternative dimensions? Your reasoning is fatally flawed, I'm afraid. Geronima, <laughs> the knife into the tabletop, where it quivered and sang. Listen to me, Nino. There is another race beneath our feet with superior weapons and advanced technology. Some years ago, there was an event that shut down the entire world. Airports, hospitals, everything. It took months for civilization to recover and it cost billions. Several governments collapsed. Miles sighed, not at all perturbed by the knife play. That is old news, sister. A five year old, five years old to be precise. Everyone knows about the Big Dark. See, is the Big Dark a, a catchy name, no? Miles couldn't help saying, Better than acronym. Geronimo ignored the jibe. Earth was thrown back to the Dark Ages, and all over the world there were a report of strange creatures with pointed ears suddenly appearing and almost as quickly disappearing. A foul manner was ground zero for this event, and since then we have been watching you and waiting for an excuse to go in. These fairies could appear again at any moment, and next time they might decide not to disappear. And now Villa Echo has disappeared and reappeared. Exactly, so it seems as though the fairies want to keep you Chico safe for their own reasons. And if they saved us once, they might save us again, reasoned Miles, scratching his crown vigorously. So we are to be bait. If you like, said Geronima. On Donkey Island, the environment is yours, but here I am in control. And you can hold two miners who have a close shave without counsel or supervision? Geronima smiled. But you are not miners in the sight of the law. Miles caught on quickly. I see. We activated an AMP, so we are terrorists. Exactamente said Geronima, bowing slightly in her chair. Miles appreciated the neatness of Geronima's plan. And as terrorists, we can be held indefinitely. Do not worry, Chico. We will release you as soon as we have a fairy in custody. Miles looked into Geronima's eyes and saw a zealot's enthusiasm for her task. We must escape, he realized. Things do not generally end so well for bait. Just ask a worm on the hook. When can I see my brother? He asked, scratching behind one ear. Soon, said Geronima, slipping the knife into a discreet pocket in her sleeve. 
First, I will speak with him. Perhaps Beckett will share some of the foul secrets. Miles almost felt sorry for Sister Geronima. Beckett had a way of making even the most steadfast people doubt their very core principles. Sister Geronima would emerge from a meeting with Beckett more confused than she went in. Follow the plan, brother, he broadcast through the wall. Remember our way out. Beckett Fowl had awoken bleary-eyed, which was most unusual for him. Generally, he exploded into consciousness, eager to embrace another day of possibilities. But on this evening, he was overtired and grumpy. This had only happened once before, when he contracted mumps as an eight-year-old and had developed a frightening case of bullfrog neck, which he absolutely loved once he got used to it. He even gave the lump a name, Bertram. But as the name of Bertram demonstrated, Beckett was too irrepressible to dawdle on in the dumps for long, and when he noticed the throwing knife in Sister Geronima's hand, his mood took a rapid upswing. Shiny knife, sister, he said, reaching across the table between them to touch the wickedly glittering blade of death. Yes, Beckett, said Geronima. Is this particular knife you're reaching for with your soft pink finger is coated in deadly nightshade, a horrible poison. Why do you even have a knife? Beckett asked, reluctantly withdrawing his soft pink finger. Geronima's gaze was almost as sharp as her knife. Zombies, Beckett Fowl. Do you ever hear of those creatures? When the apocalypse comes, this nun is going to be prepared. A very good answer, Beckett decided. Geronima was indeed a wise woman. Do you know any zombies? A person cannot really know a zombie, Master Fowl. They are only interested in the eating of brains. A deadly nightshade is very effective for stopping a zombie from eating your brain. Eating my brain, said Beckett. Cool. I may not know a zombie, continued the nun, segueing neatly into her area of interest. But I do know other creatures who are not human. Me too, said Beckett. Geronima played it calm. Really, Chico, what creatures do you know? Beckett stayed infuriatingly from the point. He pulled up his left t-shirt sleeve, revealing a red mark. This is my pet's birthmark, he explained. We call it infinity because Miles said it looks like the infinity symbol, but that's because he's stupid about the real life things. It actually looks like my pet's goldfish, Gloop, who died. But two Gloops is too many Gloops. He pointed to his tie. This is the real Gloop if you want to compare. Sister Geronima had heard about Beckett's infinity birthmark. It was well known and she had an enlarged photograph of it in her file, scanned from hospital records. Oh, Chico, she said. That is such a lovely way to remember Daily Gloop, even though he was not human. And do you remember when I was asking whether you knew any other creatures who were not human, and you said that, see, you did? Of course I remember, said Beckett, because I know a dolphin. Ah, said Geronima, disappointed. And some creatures with wings. Geronima was interested again. Yes? I met some seagulls on the way over here. More disappointment. I see. And there are crowds on the island! Beckett jumped up on the chair. Sometimes I call to them. Ka! Ka! It is I, Beckett! Ka! I am the king! Very well, Beckett. You can sit down now, Nino. Beckett did not sit. Instead, he made binoculars of his fingers and studied the stone arches. This is like a church or a dungeon! Actually, it is a little bit of both, said Geronima. There was a hidden church from the times when Catholicism was actually illegal. My group uses the underground space as a black site. I mean, as a safe space. Beckett's eyes glazed over. That is so boring, Geronimo. Geronima, corrected the nun. That is so boring, Geronima, said Beckett. Why do you care about history when there are fairies flying around on invisible bicycles? Geronima coughed twice and was glad there was no water in her mouth. Fairies, Chico. Well, one fairy, said Beckett. Miles and me know all about fairies. Artemis told us stories. Artemis is our big brother. He's in space. What stories? Beckett inverted himself on the chair, resting on his shoulders, legs in the air. He made his position even more tenuous by pushing the chair back on two legs with his foot. 
one about the time-traveling lemur, which is not a monkey, in case you don't know, and one about the ghost warrior who took over my body, which tickled for your information. And my favorite is the one about the dwarf who poops mud, which is actually very good for the environment. And there were demons who live in another dimension, and the angry pixie who blows herself up in a nuclear tube. We are, Geronimo thought, getting a little off topic. Tell me about the invisible fairy, said the nun. Beckett righted himself. I will, he said, but first, Miles. Miles is asleep, said Geronimo. Beckett was shocked. That's a lie, sister. My brothers ne said never to lie unless it's to your advantage. Which brother? asked Geronimo. Actually, Beckett actually thought before answering. His expression while thinking was one of surprise, as though he couldn't believe it was happening. Both of them, he said. And my father. Geronimo played it innocent. Miles is sleeping. My soldiers assured me that he was sound asleep. Nope, said Beckett. He's in the next room, wide awake and thinking. Uh, what is Miles thinking about, Nino? Asked Geronimo, wondering just how strong this bond between the twins was. The same thing as me, said Beckett, rubbing his scalp against the chair. Why is my head so itchy? Sister Geronima escorted Beckett next door, and the twins were reunited. They shook hands formally before hugging, so both boys' sensibilities were satisfied. Miles looked Beckett up and down. Brother, you are unharmed, I see. I do have a pain in my neck from this place, said Beckett. Now, now, admonished his twin. We don't use expressions like pain in my neck. Those are colloquiums. Can I say, this place stinks? Again, factually inaccurate. There is a certain musk, but that is virtually unavoidable in an underground crypt. Underground, said Beckett. I knew that, because of the fat air. That phrase is satisfactory, said Miles approvingly. Because gas can be compressed, its density depends on both pressure and temperature, so it's actually in fact the subterranean air is, on an atomic level, fatter. Beckett groaned. I said that already. Why do you always take everything I say and make it boring? Miles raised his lecturing finger. Education leads to knowledge, which in turn leads to power. Geronimo was beginning to sympathize with Beckett. No one likes a sabalo todo, Miles. A, how do you say it? Know-it-all. Miles was offended. But I am not a know-it-all sister. There aren't many know-it-alls. There are taking an infinity of lifetimes to know even the tiniest fraction of everything. And the more we learn, the less we know, correcto? Sister Geronima completed the maxim with the hope of cutting off the foul boy's lecture. The more we learn, the less we know? Asked Miles aghast. What kind of infantile babbling is that? How can one learn more and know less? Obviously, I was going to say, the more we learn, the more we know. Honestly, is this what passes for intelligence in the intelligence community? That is not what I meant, precisamente. Miles shrugged. I cannot help what you thought you meant, sister. I merely interpret your words and draw inferences from the movements of your eyeballs, your limbs, and general deportment. I am not a mind reader. Geronimo was beginning to suspect that perhaps she was not the only expert interrogator in the room. Muy bien, Pius Fowl, she said. You have made your point. I will be less casual with my use of proverbs in the future. Miles was still in shock. The more we learn, the less we know indeed. If that were actually the case, my entire life would be without meaning or purpose. We must seek knowledge at all speed. Humans can but scratch the surface in this life and hope for total recall with each incarnation. Beckett heard the word scratch and was reminded to scratch, which he did. And since scratching was almost as contagious as yawning, Miles was soon engaged in the same activity. Madre de Dios, said Geronima, irritated at yet another distraction from her line of questioning. But what is this scratching? Obviously, your heads are pure ictic, sister, snapped Miles. He probably means itchy, said Beckett. Yes, I do mean itchy. It started in the helicopter. I suspected some form of allergic reaction, but now I'm leaning toward parasitic infestation. Sister Geronimo recoiled. Los parasitos? No, I will not permit it. Miles snorted. <laughs> your parismo is entirely irrelevant to parasites, sister. Parasites tend not to speak English. Or Spanish, for that matter. The sleepy mask was itchy, 
said Beckett, who was now knuckling his hairline. Geronimo was skeptical. After all, were these not the brothers of Artemis Fowl, one of the world's premier schemers? Ven aquí, chico, she said to Beckett, who immediately stepped closer without needing a translation of the command, which Geronimo should have picked up on since Spanish was not in the boy's file, but she was focused on debunking this scalp nonsense. I was knowing it, she said, raking manicured nails across Beckett's scalp. There is nothing. But there was something. Little white bugs, which popped like minuscule blisters under her nails. Madre de Dios! She cried, stepping back. Los piejos, the lice! And while it was true that Sister Geronima Gonzalez Ramones de Zaterte had been the intelligence business for many decades and had not once flinched in the face of death, there are very few individuals on this earth who can behold the scalp crawling with headlights and not feel a shudder of revulsion. In Geronima's case, the shudder was so strong that, for a moment, she seemed to be dancing. Oh, for heaven's sake, snapped Miles. If we are, as I suspect, being feasted upon by Pediculus Humanus Capitus, there is no cause for panic. All that's required is a series of treatments with medicated shampoo. No, said Beckett. I like my insect friends. Sister Geronima composed herself. <clears throat> Apologies, children, have no fear. I will chastise the helicopter team for this infection, but we are not having the luxury of time. There will be no series of medical shampoosings. Shampooing, corrected Miles. And if there is to be no shampooing, then what do you suggest? Something barbaric, no doubt. A phrase popped into Geronimus' head. A phrase that had been planted by Miles during his solo interrogation. No, nothing barbaric. You shall both have the close shave. Miles pretended to be appalled. You would shave our heads? This is how you treat your guests? That is how I treat my guests who are infectado, said Geronima with a nunly firmness. And she raised one hand and snapped her fingers. Obviously, someone was watching because seconds later, two burly figures entered the room wearing lemon yellow hazmat suits with beekeeper style headpieces. For heaven's sake, said Miles. That's a little much, don't you think? We are two boys with headlights, not radioactive aliens. You are not simply two boys, countered Sister Geronima. You are two foul boys. There is a big difference. Maz accepted this backhanded compliment with a nod. It was true. Foul boys were exceptional, even more so than their captors suspected. Take them away, said Geronima to the burly figures. Shave these niños. Make them both totalmente without the hairs and also burn their clothing. Every stitch. No hairs, exalted Beckett. A new thing! I am somewhat less enthusiastic about our imminent shearing than my brother, said Miles. But I'm not fond of having blood-sucking insects so near to my brain, which is conceivable they could somehow corrupt my cerebral spinal fluid, which could, in theory, arrest my thought processes somewhat. So, I suppose an all-over shave is practically foolproof. Practically, said Geronima. But to be fairly certain, also use the steam lances. Lances! crowed Brackett over the moon. Lances and shaving! Surely this was a prince among days! At least 40 degrees, advised Miles. Otherwise it's pointless. Precisamente, said Sister Geronima. First the lance and then the shave, and then the lance once more for the good measures. Both hazmat guys nodded, but if a person happened to be a student of kinesthetics, that is to say, body language, that person might notice that one of the hazmat people seemed to find the notion of an all-over shave quite upsetting in spite of his nod. There was an audible crackle from the material of his suit as he flinched. Perhaps this was because the fellow was imagining the forced shaving of his own beard, which he had proudly brushed a hundred strokes per day for the past 132 years. For, as you have no doubt deduced, the second hazmat guy was, in fact, our villain, Lord Teddy Bleedem Dry, who would actually appreciate being referred to as a guy. Guy Fox, who had played the infamous gunpowder plot to blow up the parliament, was one of Teddy's heroes, as he himself had considered a similar course of action some years previously, when the House of Commons had banned fox hunting. It really irked the Duke of Sicily that commoners should be allowed to dictate to a fellow that what he may or may not choose chase on his own plot. But how on earth had Teddy managed to infiltrate Acronym's black site? This was a reasonable question and deserves an answer. 
And the answer is perhaps more straightforward than one might think, given the effectiveness of modern security systems. The problem with these security systems is that somewhere in the chain there is a human link. And humans are invariably fallible, often inexpert, and occasionally dull-witted. The human whom Lord Teddy had encountered was all three. To rewind, as they say, Almost three hours earlier, you may remember that Lord Teddy's Maishi CV bullet had coated the mini troll in radiation infused cellophane in case his prey somehow removed it itself from the shooting zone. Once this had come to pass with the aid of an army helicopter, the Duke nipped down to the jetty and unzipped the tarlapin, covering a collapsible ultra light aircraft that he habitually towed behind his yacht like a jet ski. He used a fob to fold out the wings, which bore his personal insignia climbed into the tight two-seater cockpit and took off in pursuit of the Westland helicopter. Lord Bleedham Dry had purchased the seaplane from his old pal Ishi Maishi, who claimed to supply the majority of the world's most discerning criminals. Maishi's actual company slogan was, 90% of the planet's criminal masterminds can't be wrong and the other 10% are incarcerated. Teddy smiled whenever he thought of that slogan. Maishi certainly had a marketing genius, not to mention a technical one. The Maishi Skyblade was indeed a wonderful craft, and it came with certain features tailored to the discerning poacher's needs. Features such as an aluminum fuselage wrapped in quantum stealth material, so that the craft was virtually invisible to the naked or electronic eye at night, and a weighted hunter's net that could transport large animals several hundred miles. The Duke adored his little plane and had already pre-ordered a Maishi flying car, which would roll off the line five years before any police force in the world got their hands on one. Borders really wouldn't exist for a chap with a long-range flying motor. Lord Teddy's smartphone synced with the Skyblade's on-guard navigation, quickly extrapolating the most likely destination for the army helicopter. And so, two hours later, the Skyblade swooped into late-night Dutch airspace before the Fowl Twins even arrived. Teddy sat down illegally in the western docks opposite the old Palace of Justice, which he thought a pleasing irony, and dawdled in the shadows of a moored party barge while the troll nappers made their way into the city. Amsterdam was winding down for the evening, but there were still a few clusters of bedshy stragglers ambling along the dockside, though none had noticed his light aircraft slicing like a tailor's scissors through the green silk of the canal surface. Lord Teddy found himself humming along with the strains of You'll Never Walk Alone, which was being drunkenly mangled by a bunch of lurching soccer fans. The Duke did consider wrapping a bunch of cellophane for a spot of target practice, but quickly dismissed the idea. Business before fun. Ted, he told himself. Keep your eyes on the prize, don't you know? He did know. If there was one thing the Duke of Sicily had learned over the decades, it was focus. Teddy did not have long to wait. As the Skyblade's computer had predicted, the army helicopter landed in the Schiapol region, not quite in the regular airport, but in the adjacent industrial park. This slight deviation by the tracker bleep both infuriated Lord Bleedham Dry and established that his adversaries had serious political clout. He himself had been forced, by pernickety international law, to sneak into the Netherlands literally under the radar, while his helicopter was given leave to land near the airport, where passport controls would not be exercised. Most convenient for them. Having said that, Teddy could not fume for long, because the troll's bleep required his full attention as it pulsed directly toward the city center. The Duke lowered the Skyblade's wings to a pontoon position and prepared to discreetly tail his enemies wherever they might be going in the city of water. He was rewarded 20 minutes later by the sight of a mini convoy passing by on shore. Two custom-built SUVs, super stealthy. They were, Teddy thought, reminiscent of panthers prowling near a waterhole. Very nice, thought the Duke, wondering briefly if Maishi was supplying governments these days. Unlikely, he thought. Criminals pay more promptly than governments. Lord Teddy shadowed the black automobiles, sticking to the far side of the canal, a veiling of the shelter provided by the hulking keels of barges and houseboats. By incredible good fortune, the Duke's landing spot was less than a mile from the convoy's destination, which appeared to be a rowdy cafe on the corner of Prussian Grand. A cafe, thought Teddy, allowing the Skyblade to drift behind the gunwales of the houseboat. Now why would security types pick the only busy spot on the blasted street? It occurred to Teddy that perhaps one of the foul urchins needed a bathroom break. But no, the entire company dismounted and shuffled inside, grouped in an irregular cluster that might be mistaken for random by members of the general public, but Lord Teddy recognized as a shielding formation. The twins are inside that bunch. I bent my electric eels on it. 
and where the twins went, the Duke must follow. His foreseeable and unforeseeable future depended on it. Teddy was reluctant to abandon the Skyblade in a public dock, but the craft's anti-theft systems were considerably more punitive than the legal versions. Any theft possessed of the temerity to lay a finger on the seaplane's bio-coated handle would find himself with 10,000 extra volts of electricity coursing through his system, so the Duke felt reasonably confident that the Skyblade would be safe from ne'er-do-wells and good for naughts. He stepped smartly across the humpbacked bridge toward the cafe, rubber-soled boots squeaking on the cobblestones as though the Duke were squishing a church mouse with each step. Amsterdam never changes, he thought, as the familiar aromas of stale beer and dank sweat rolled the raucous music through the open door. Still the town of sailors frittering away their wages. Frittering was not in Lord Teddy's nature, especially when it came to time and so he compartmentalized any doubts he might have had about leaving his smashing flying machine out in the open and double-timed a quick requinter around the building, which, like so many Amsterdam stilted houses, was leaning heavily against its neighbor like a drunken companion. The tracking contraption integrated into his wristwatch informed Teddy with a teardrop alert that his quarry were now below sea level. They have descended into some kind of basement, the Duke thought. That is an unwelcome development. Unwelcome because it came subterranean strongholds were notoriously difficult to crack, which is why guerrilla fighters often use tunnels to hide themselves away from enemy forces. And Teddy had rather uncomfortable memories of tussling with a wiry South African boar in a dusty catacomb under the veil. The blighter had the nerve to dog on my beard, Teddy thought now, which is simply not done. Teddy had almost resigned himself to yet another period of surveillance when he came upon a narrow stairwell that led down to a doorway daubed in shadow. The steps had been compressed by centuries of pressure from the adjacent building and were as irregularly pitched as the keys of a distressed piano. Aha, thought Teddy. Perhaps some measure of force could be applied to that door and it could be breached. As it turned out, there was no need for force. On the door at any rate, for simply and all of a sudden opened and a lanky fellow appeared, clad from head to toe in a yellow decontamination suit and somewhat furtively composing a text message on his phone while he held the steel door open with his foot. No cell service inside, I'd wager, thought Teddy. I would also wager that Johnny Texter is breaking security protocol. Lord Teddy was right on both accounts, and, as he had never been one to look a gift horse in the mouth, the Duke slipped one hand into his jacket pocket to retrieve the brass knuckles nestled there. When life gives you a lemon, thought Teddy, slipping his fingers neatly into the weapon's finger holes, you knock the lemon senseless. One blow should do the trick, he told himself and then it would be simplicity itself to disguise myself in that garish suit. On this occasion, the Duke was wrong. The job actually required two blows.